What is up, my friends and fellow busy bees? If you're new here, welcome, or if you've been here before, welcome back. Today is a special episode. I'm going to be answering your questions. So today we are going to be talking about the more general furniture finishing questions that I have gotten over on my Instagram. If you're not already following, head on over and give me a follow. It's Mel Did It Herself. And please feel free to send over any questions you may have that you would like included in upcoming Ask Me Anything episodes of the podcast because I would be happy to include them. Next week, we're going to be talking all about the business and running a furniture refinishing business or side hustle questions that I've received. So also make sure you come back for that next week. So I have six questions for today's episode. I will be sure to leave timestamps in the show notes of today's episode if you want to jump to specific questions just to hear those. So feel free to check those out if you're in a rush. And let's hop on into it. So the first question I got was a difficult one, to be honest. It's, what's your favorite furniture flip you've ever done? And of course, um. I'm not going to really answer it with one specific one, because if you didn't already know, my middle name is Indecision. So I do have three options. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, there's kind of like a fourth, because here's the thing. Listen, there's so many different aspects that I could like about a furniture flip. It might be more sentimental to me. It might be something really cool about the piece itself. I might just really love what the end product turned out like. Like there's so many different like facets that I could look at to determine what my favorite one is. And so I didn't come to any conclusion and I kind of have like different ones for each of those facets. Okay, will you allow that? Thank you so much. My first piece is literally my first piece, the first furniture makeover that I ever did. If you've been around for a while, you will have seen this pop up in different areas. It's on the front page of my website because it just holds a special place in my heart. It was my grandmother's sewing table that I painted, spray painted, I might add, in an emerald green, and it still sits in my guest room in my home. And it's one of the very few pieces of refinished furniture that I actually have in my home. The only pieces that I have are ones that were given to me from my grandmother and I refinished. Everything else furniture-wise in our house was kind of already set in stone before I started doing this work, so that's a little fun fact. But just the sentiment behind it, the fact that I now, if I was tackling that project today, would have done it in such a different way. Like I would have had much different steps that I did. I don't even know if I cleaned it, to be honest, before I did it. But it turned out fine. Like it's good. It's still holding up great. But it just is such a reminder to me all the time of where I started. And I can truly remember how proud I felt when I was finished it and was looking at it and was loving it. And that's just always motivation for me as I I think about it, when I see it, when I come across it in my photos and that kind of thing. So it holds a really special place in my heart for that reason. The second piece, which is the one that just popped into my head while I was thinking about it, is my favorite in terms of like pieces that I've come across and known the history behind because you don't always necessarily know where the pieces come from. Actually, there's another one that's popping into my mind. So like, again, this is the indecision in me, but I'll stick with this one. It was a piece that was a wooden bench that was taken from the old Ottawa train station in the early 1900s, I want to say. It was a piece that a client brought to me for custom work fairly early on in me offering my custom work. And so that was super cool just to work on that piece and to know the history behind it and just how old it is. I always love working on antique pieces like that. I have another client that also brought me a piece that was about 100 years old. So those are just really cool just to know how long they've been around and how much life they've lived and just to know that I'm making it over and giving it a whole new life that it's now going to be able to continue to live and to remain in good shape is just I don't know pretty cool it's one of the cool things about this job and then the last two pieces that I have are for the end product is what makes them a little bit more special to me so first off I have a dresser a chest of drawers that I worked on at one point and refinished I stained a portion of it and painted a portion of it and then painted the hardware. 
the color that I used on it was Hampton Olive and it had really unique hardware on it. They're like little arrows almost, like little triangle arrow looking handles that were totally dull and lifeless and like kind of looked awkward on the piece before, which was super ugly before. It was like some weird green, almost like laminate looking finish. And then once I was able to refinish it all, I sprayed the original hardware and it just made it pop so much nicer on the piece. And it was like the thing that drew your attention in. And I just love the look of that piece. And I think it's so unique. Like I don't think I'll ever come across hardware that's the same as that again. So that is just one that sticks out in my mind in terms of what it looked like and just how drastic of a difference it made, even when I didn't change really anything about it, just the finish that was on it. And then a fourth piece is a recent one that I have done. It was a modern looking navy buffet that I did recently. I put new hardware on it and painted the base and did a stain and like a paint wash on the top. I just love the look of it. I've gotten a lot of really positive feedback online and in person about it as well. And I just love how it turned out. It was, again, one of those that was such a drastic difference. And it was my highest selling price tag to date in terms of like pieces that I was selling online, not custom work. So that was exciting too. I think the design of it all just came together really beautifully. It wasn't anything like crazy. I didn't do anything like drawing a design by hand or anything like that on it. It was very straightforward, but I just love the look of it. And I think it's probably a design that I'll recreate on a future piece. So that was one that came to mind as well. Thanks so much for asking. The second question I got was, have you ever had a haunted piece of furniture? Which is such a fun question. I have not, to my knowledge. Knock on wood. I don't think I've ever come across a piece of haunted furniture. However, I also don't know that I would know if I had. I haven't felt any bad vibes at any given point when I've been working with a piece. There's definitely been some pieces where like somebody might have been fucking with me a little bit, you know, with all the things like all the hurdles that came my way during that process. Definitely been some pieces that have thrown me for a bit of a loop, but I don't know that it was bad juju that was doing that. I think it was like just really bleedy wood and things like that. But yeah, I don't know if I would ever necessarily know. I don't know where I stand really in terms of like the paranormal and hauntedness. I am kind of just a skeptical person. So I think I would truly need to experience it for myself to be able to believe that it was real. So yeah, I don't know. But I don't know that I want to test it out either at the same time. Like I'm open to believing, but I would need to know that I had ruled out any other possible explanation. You know what I mean? And then that would also cause like a bit of a hiccup in trying to sell that piece because like I feel like if it's haunted that's something you should like disclose but at the same time that's not gonna make anyone super jazzed to buy your piece and or maybe then they'll be like who is this person that thinks that it's haunted like what's their deal you know so I don't think I want to experience that personally but no thankfully I have not had to deal with that at any point as of yet and hopefully never. Question number three is, what is your preferred primer before using fusion mineral paint? And so if you've been here for a while, then you'll know that fusion mineral paint is my go-to paint brand when I'm working on my furniture makeovers. I'm an affiliate with them. I really believe in the brand and in the product, and it's what I use every day, so I prove that through the use of it on my pieces. I've really never come across any issues using the product. I highly recommend it for furniture. It's very durable. It adheres well to pieces because it has been made and formulated to adhere to furniture. However, I also always recommend doing a primer and a top coat when you're going to be working on a piece just to be on the safe side because you never know. Fusion does have a built-in acrylic resin top coat, so that's great. It adds some durability more than the average furniture paint to the piece, but I always like to just make sure that the pieces are as protected as I can, and anything that I can do to ensure that, I'm going to. So I do always recommend adding a top coat as well as a primer. And now I don't always use a primer with Fusion, I will admit, but I'm always assessing the situation before determining whether or not to use it. So So number one, if I am painting over a wood surface that has been sanded down to the raw wood, I'm going to always prime first because I want to ensure that there's going to be no bleed through. 
And in that case, I'm going to be using 99% of the time Zinzer Bin shellac-based primer. And it's because the shellac is going to create a protective barrier between the wood and the paint so that any wood tannins that may try to peek through will be blocked by that shellac-based primer. I would also prime a piece if it had a bit of a slick finish. I'm always sanding the pieces ahead of time, whether it's a scuff sand or sanding it down all the way to the base, whatever that material may be. And if you don't know the different material options that your furniture may be made of, make sure you go back in the episode list and check out the last episode, number 75, which helps you to determine which material you're working with and lets you know a little bit about each one. But if I'm working with a slick material like laminate, for example, I'm going to want to really prep that surface so that it can have some teeth on it for the paint to adhere to. So I'm going to use a primer, some sort of bonding primer is going to work best. I like to use the Kills Original for this. It's just kind of an all-around good water-based primer, and I'll use that on a slick surface like that. Or if I'm trying to make the base that I'm working on just really uniform, so if I've maybe made some repairs, use some wood filler, something like that, where I have different levels in terms of how porous the material is going to be, and so the paint may show that through once I paint it on, I'm going to use a primer first. And again, in that case, I would usually use the Kills Original. I like it because, again, I've never had any issues with it. I can access it quickly and easily. I get mine at Home Depot. It's fairly inexpensive in the grand scheme of things, and it is water-based, so it's a really good cleanup. You could just use soap and water, whereas with the Zinzer Bin, the shellac-based primer, that is definitely more expensive and also is shellac-based, so the cleanup is way more annoying, to be honest, so I use that sparingly just when I need it to prevent the bleed through. Another product that I've been using a lot as of late that I'm actually really liking is the Fusion Primer that they have, which is their Fusion Ultra Grip. And any of the products that I mention here today will be linked in the show notes as well below. Also worth noting that I as a Fusion affiliate, also have a code for 10% off any products on their website, so I'll be sure to include that as well in the show notes, as well as any other links that you may be interested in. But what I really like about the Fusion Primer is that it's actually clear, so that can be really useful if you are going to be working with some sort of material that's darker and you're going to be painting dark during your makeover. And then if you were to go in with something like a white primer, that would then result in needing a lot more paint to get it back to that dark finish. Another option that you can do is tinting the primer, but then that requires me to like get a separate container, pour out how much I think I need, and that kind of thing. And I usually just work out of the container of the actual product. I know that's not great to do, but I'm truly just that lazy. So for me, being able to use the Fusion Primer I just squirt it right onto the piece, onto the surface if it's flat, and then go in with my roller and roll it onto the piece, and it's clear, it dries quickly, it's pretty self-leveling, so I've been really enjoying that lately, and that's going to become a good, consistent go-to in my arsenal, I'm pretty sure. Okay, then we have a couple specific questions that I'm assuming people are currently working on on projects or maybe putting off projects because they don't know the answer to this or maybe don't feel like researching this or maybe have tried to research this and are finding a lot of conflicting information, which I find is the case for a lot of these furniture makeover projects. But I will do my best to respond based on my experience of what I know. So I have a question of what is the safest way to remove rust from a metal table frame? So the easiest way, the safest way, and most straightforward, because you probably have these things already in your home, is to combine vinegar and baking soda. So I typically use cleaning vinegar, but even if you just have a white vinegar that you would use for cooking, that'll work too. Mixing that with baking soda, it's going to turn into a great rust remover. Basically, the vinegar breaks down the particles, and then the baking soda is like an abrasive. So it just helps to act as an abrasive to break down those rust particles without leaving any sort of markings on the metal. 
Like if you were to use a low grit sandpaper, that would leave scratches on the piece potentially. But if you use a higher grit sandpaper, something that's a little bit more fine, but still abrasive, that's going to help to get rid of the finish without leaving any sort of scratches. So that baking soda is going to work in the same way. And so what you're going to do is to make a paste from that vinegar and baking soda, which will be probably about a 60-40 split with 60% baking soda to 40% vinegar, maybe a little bit more, but you'll want it to be in a paste form. And then you can rub that onto the spots on the metal table frame that have rust and then let it sit for like... 30 minutes, maybe more, you'll be able to kind of see it working and it will start to bubble a little bit and you'll see it eating away at that rust. And then you can go in with some really fine steel wool and just rub that away kind of buff it away if it needs any extra help after doing that. And that will, in theory, get rid of the rust without using any sort of harsh chemicals or anything like that. The next question that came in is, can you paint vinyl cabinets? If so, what's the prep involved before painting and what paint would you use? So yes, you absolutely can paint vinyl or laminate is another word for it, cabinets. These are super common, especially in like rentals or older homes, I find. Like that classic white laminate with the little wooden handle at the bottom. But yes, you absolutely can paint them. And I think it's a great, really easy, well, it will require some time and effort, but inexpensive for sure and impactful makeover that you can make in a kitchen, assuming that you own the kitchen or the house that it's in or you have permission from your landlord. And if you are looking for something that's an upgrade, but not necessarily a forever upgrade because you are renting, a really good option for this is to add basically a wrap to those cabinet doors using like peel and stick wallpaper or something like that. So that's something that you can look into too, but if you're looking to paint, absolutely. Okay. So the prep that would be involved before painting is you want to make the surface clean and prepared for paint. So typically the vinyl or laminate is over particle board. So you don't have solid wood under there. So you want to be really gentle with the surface of it. If it has not been damaged or it isn't cracking or has any like sort of wear in that way, it's going to make a really great base for the paint. First, you want to clean everything really thoroughly with, I usually just recommend Dawn dish soap and some warm water. Get it soapy, wipe everything down, then go in with a clean, slightly dampened cloth and wipe everything back just to get rid of any residue and let everything dry thoroughly. And now if you have any sort of cracks or damage in it, I would recommend filling that in with wood filler or something similar before proceeding just to get everything smooth. And then we're going to sand the surface of it just to basically scuff it up a bit and give something for the paint and primer to adhere to. So I would say use something over 120 grit in terms of sandpaper, maybe around 150, because you want to scuff it up, but not eat through that laminate surface. Also, I'd recommend taking all the doors down off of the cabinets if you haven't already. It's probably just going to make everything easier. You can lay it out flat. So sand everything down, and then you're going to want to wipe those back again to get rid of any of the sanding dust. You can do that by hand or use an electric sander, whichever you have access to or your budget allows. And then I would recommend priming the cabinets. I have previously done my own kitchen cabinets before I even started doing these furniture makeovers. And although they've held up really well, especially with the fake nails that I always wear that I've absolutely stabbed those cabinets all over the place, there are some places where it's showing somewhere and I did not prime. So I would recommend priming just because whether you think you're touching it or not, you really do touch the cabinet doors so often, especially on the cabinets that you're using most often, like probably if you're like me, like around the snack cupboard or something like that. So again, just to make it last as long as possible, we're going to do the upfront work to avoid having to go back and do touch-ups down the road and things like that. So using a primer, since it's a vinyl or laminate, we don't have to worry about bleed through because it's not wood underneath it. We're just working with like a particle board. So Our main focus in using this primer is to create a bonding agent so that the primer is bonding to the laminate and then the paint can bond to the primer and make a bit of a primer sandwich. Adding the primer on, I would recommend using 
If you have a paint sprayer, use a paint sprayer. Most people don't have one of those just laying around. So I would use a roller. I like to use foam rollers. I find they get a much better finish than a microfiber roller personally. And then, like I said, I'm a big fan of Fusion Mineral Paint. I have seen it used on plenty of cabinets in kitchens. I would recommend using Fusion Mineral Paint just because I know that it works really well. My personal kitchen cabinets are not done in Fusion, but that is only because, like I said, I wasn't doing this work at that time. It was literally like one of my first DIY projects that I took on, which is like a little bit gutty, but it's what I did. So if I had done it after having started doing this work, I would have done it in Fusion. I would have done it in Fusion Midnight Blue, but instead I have a different navy color. But yeah, I would recommend using Fusion. I think it works great. And like I said, it has that built-in acrylic resin top coat. So it'll have really great durability. Depends on the size of the kitchen, but it shouldn't take too much in terms of quantity of paint to accomplish your average sized kitchen because it's really pigmented in terms of color. So some of the lighter colors, some of their whites do require quite a few layers. Um, picket fence is definitely one of them that I have come across. But aside from that, I typically only need to do like two layers of paint. If you're going to be doing a darker color, I would recommend tinting your primer a little bit so that it's just like a little dollop of the dark colored paint that you're going to be painting it. Add that into the primer, mix it in well, and then it will be a little bit deeper than like a stark white that you're working off of. And it should take away a couple layers that you're needing to do of the paint to get it nice and opaque. And then might as well do everything that you can up front to protect these things. Once you have the color built up and you have a couple layers of paint on those cabinets, I would also recommend adding a top coat. It's going to depend on the color that you're using, but I like working with a water-based polyurethane best for top coating, and it's just going to add some durability on there. Again, I apply it with a roller or a sprayer if you have it. And that's going to ensure that they stay looking as good as new for years to come. And then you're done. You have a whole kitchen makeover. Congrats. And just a reminder that after you complete the makeover, you can set everything back up, get it all reattached so that all the cabinets are hanging. But just know that it takes 21 to 30 days for those products to fully cure together. So so just go easy on them for about a month after you get everything completed because any sort of wear and tear that you do on them could result in dents and things like that ending up in the finish and then it's going to stay there. So just be really cautious for that first month. And then after the 30 day period, it should be nice and hardened up and super durable for years to come. And send me pictures if you do it for yourself. I'd love to see. And the last question that I received is what piece of advice would you give to yourself when you were first starting out refinishing furniture? Which is a question that I love. And that's actually a question that I usually ask when I'm like first starting out doing anything or like I'm able to talk to an expert on anything. Like when I start a new job, for example, if I'm with a trainer or some sort of mentor, I always ask like, what do you wish you knew or what do you wish someone taught you early on in this role? Because I think it's just a really invaluable way to figure things out and like learn the things that people aren't often thinking of to teach you get a lot of really useful information. But my piece of advice when I first started doing makeovers, I guess there'd be a few things. I would say just start. Like I put off trying out a makeover for quite a while because I was just consuming so much YouTube tutorials and things like that and trying to like do the research. I like to learn things. I'm a lifelong learner, if you haven't heard. So I just really wanted to learn all that I could before I actually tried it out. But the reality was I had to learn on the job, like as I went. You can conceptualize so much of these methods and the design that you have in mind, but you got to just do it and then roll with the punches of what that piece presents to you to really know what to do or to really be able to think on your toes or adapt and pivot on your design on a piece. And so I would have just saved time watching tutorials and just jumped right in. I also would give myself the advice of don't worry how things are turning out right now because it's only going to get better the more that you do it. 
I don't think this is something that I harped on too much, but now looking back, like the finish that I was getting then versus the finish that I'm getting now and the attention to detail that I have is just so different. I just notice things more now. I understand the finish that I can get now versus what I was getting before, and I know how to achieve that. So you just learn in time with trial and error and learning from other people that do the work and picking up tips and tricks along the way. If you aren't already, be sure to sign up for my Friday Furniture Focus newsletter. I always share little furniture flipping tips and tricks in there from other creators who are sharing that like insider knowledge of things that you may not have thought of before. And there's a lot of really clever and time and money saving tips that you can pick up from there. So that's on my website, meldidherself.ca, that you can sign up for that. I'll leave it in the show notes. But just those little things that you're only going to pick up in time... And like I said, with trial and error, so just telling myself at the get-go that it's going to get better, but just to like keep on keeping on in the meantime. And thirdly, if I was giving this, this wasn't the question, but if I was giving this advice to somebody else, because I think I had a pretty good hold on it myself and I didn't necessarily need the advice, like I kind of figured it out on my own, but I think it would be a good reminder for some people is that... The internet doesn't fucking matter. (laughs) And the people on the internet who have opinions do not matter. I'm a pretty independent person. I kind of trust my gut on most things in life. And so I don't think this was something that I fell prey to all that much. However, people on the internet, if you are sharing your flips on the internet and your journey, are going to have advice, constructive criticism, just opinions that they feel are super important to share and just to remind yourself that they don't matter. Like if you don't agree with it, if you are getting defensive about it, just like let it fall like water off a duck's back because it could really get you down and I can see it getting some people down and people really harping on comments that they get or like I said, constructive criticism, like some people may be thinking that they're trying to help, but aren't wording it in a way that is super helpful. (laughs) And it's maybe just a little bit condescending or whatever. But just remind yourself that you don't know who's on the other side of that computer. So, you know, they may have a completely different skill level than you, style than you. Like people might comment, oh my God, like that was so ugly what you did. But you don't know what's in their house. They could have a completely different style than you. They could have a horrible style. They may not know what style is. And so they don't appreciate what you did to a piece. But just reminding yourself that that doesn't matter and not letting your opinion of yourself and your work come from validation of others, especially of others on the internet, I think is really important and a really important reminder. And I've seen it get to so many people. I cannot tell you how many people started doing this work and started sharing on social media around the time that I did. And they are no longer accounts that are active. They have either publicly left social media as a result of this kind of stuff, or they have gone silent for like months or years. And I know, like I I saw the downfall coming and then there was the silence. Like I remember these accounts and the people behind them because it was really exciting to like follow other people's journeys who was doing the same thing as me and to not see them around anymore really like breaks my heart because, you know, it's no surprise to any of us that the internet is a horrible place to be <laughs> sometimes. And so to anybody who is starting out this work and is particularly sharing that on the internet, just a reminder to like trust yourself, trust that you know what is best, have some people who are those trusted sources that if you have a question or you're looking for input, you go to, but not leaving that open to any John, Dick, or Harry who may happen to have your content come across their page when they're in some shitty mood that they feel the need to instill their opinions onto you. And something you may not know about me, I love little motivational messages. They always get me fired up and I keep a running list of ones that are especially catchy or speak to me in the notes app on my phone. And I end every podcast episode with one that I've noted down over the years so that you can leave our time here each week feeling inspired, motivated, and ready to take on whatever comes your way this week. So this week's Mel's motivational message is part of being successful is about asking questions and listening to the answers. 
because as a lifelong learner, I know that the only way that I've gotten to where I am today and where I'll continue to aspire to be to is because I do stop to ask those questions. And if I don't understand something, even if it seems like something that's super straightforward, that obviously everyone seems to be understanding because no one else is asking this question, I'm still going to stop the person and be like, hey, this might be a dumb question, but blah, 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 blah. Or potentially looking up the answer myself if it's something that might be readily available online or something like that. But my ego is not so big that I cannot ask questions and asking for people's insight and experience as well. Like I said, asking the question, what's something that you wish you had been taught sooner when it comes to X, Y, or Z? And just having those thought-provoking questions that are going to get things out of people that they're not just normally thinking about or talking about, like the big talk questions, the opposite of the small talk, you know what I mean? Because that's the only way you're really going to learn. And then also not having your ego so inflated that you aren't listening to the answers that are being provided to you. Because if someone's taking the time, the energy, the effort, the brain power to answer a question of yours, number one, assume that they're being truthful and sincere in what they're saying and that they have your best interests at heart. And number two, know that what they're telling you is probably based on their experience and what they wish they had done or said or whatever sooner. So it's probably worthwhile for you to be listening and taking it to heart. So remember that as you go forward this week to ask the questions and make sure you're listening to those answers. If you have any questions that you want included in an upcoming episode, whether it be about running a furniture refinishing business or just a general question about doing furniture makeovers, make sure to head on over to my Instagram and send me a DM. You can also, if you're listening on Spotify today or on YouTube, leave a question in the comments or in the question box that is included, and I'll be sure to include them in an upcoming episode. And make sure you come back next week for all of the questions that have been asked about running a business. We have some really good ones, and I have lots of information to share. All right, that's it for now. I appreciate your time, and I will catch you guys.